From the University of Arizona Distance Learning Program, this is Optical Sciences 505, Diffraction and Interferometry, with Dr. James Wyant. This broadcast is authorized by the Arizona Board of Regents on behalf of the University of Arizona. Any reproduction or retransmission of this course or use of same for granting of credit without the express written consent of the University of Arizona is strictly prohibited. Well, I'll say good morning to everyone. So, let's see, what were we talking about at the end of last class? Can anyone remember? Circular aperture. Okay, well, let's um, go on here with a circular aperture then, talk more about it this morning. So, remember last class what we had here. We had um, our circular aperture. We had the, the radius was um, R, I guess we called it. And the way that we were integrating this was that we were breaking it into strips. So first off, we set us rotationally symmetric. So we need to look only along one axis here at the diffraction pattern. So we broke it into little strips of uh, width dy and at height here of, of y. And um, right at the end of the class, I think we had that u as a function of this angle theta was equal to 2 e to the ik square root of z squared plus y naught squared. So we'd picked uh, the coordinate system such that uh, x naught was equal to 0. Divided then by i lambda z, u sub i. And then the, doing this integral here of the square root of r squared minus y squared um, e to minus i k y sine theta integrating over y here. And y went from minus r to plus r. So I think that's where we were right at the uh, end of the last class. So now, typically, what people do when they want to solve this is that they will say, well, let some quantity, say u, be equal to y divided by r. And we're going to find something else, rho which we'll, we'll set equal to kr sine theta. And um, if that's true, then well, first off, we can say that dy is r du. And we can say that um, ky sine theta, well, that's what we had up here in the equation. We can write that ky sine theta is um, k r u sine theta. And um, then we could write that as u times rho. OK? And the other thing we, so that will take care of what we have in the exponent up here. We want to play a little bit with this square root here. And so the next thing we could say is that square root of r squared minus y squared is r square root 1 minus y squared divided by r squared. And so that's r times the square root of 1 minus u squared. OK, so now we're going to take these various quantities and plug it back into the expression up here. And we will get, I'll go to a clean sheet of paper here. We're going to get the u of theta. Uh, we still have an i lambda z down in the basement here. 
and up here we're going to get a 2. We're going to get uh, a couple of r's here, r and r, r squared then, and then e to the i, k, square root, z squared plus y naught squared, so that we don't change. And we get a u sub i. And then we're going to have an integral here. And so we've already taken one hour from here outside, but we're left now. Um, bring this down. From the square root of r squared minus y squared, we've got an r which we've taken outside. So inside here, we still have a square root of 1 minus u squared. And um, then uh, this will become e minus i u um, rho and then we get a du and uh, u is going to go from minus 1 to plus 1. Okay, so this is what we've ended up with. Now this integral right here is a, a well-known integral. I don't know how many of you dreamed about this one last night, but not too many. Anyway, this turns out to be pi j1 of rho over rho. And where the j1 is a Bessel function of order 1. Okay. So the result we have then is that u of theta is equal to pi r squared e to the i k square root of um, z squared plus y naught squared divided by i lambda z and use of i, whatever we're illuminating with, the amplitude of illumination. And then we have 2j1 of rho over rho. And we keep, we keep this 2 in here. It came from there. We put that inside here because now when rho goes to uh, 0, this 2j1 of rho over rho will go to 1, it turns out. And so the irradiance, if you like, is some I naught, and uh, in a minute we'll worry about what I naught is. But I naught times 2 J1 of rho over rho. And just to repeat here that rho was Kr sine theta. Or if you like, it's uh, pi over lambda 2R i.e. the diameter times the sine theta. So the radiance goes is 2 j1 of rho over rho quantity squared. And I think, uh, what is it Gaskell likes to call that now? Sombrero function or something? I don't know. Okay. We'll call it 2 j1 of rho over rho. Just to be different from him. So we'll celebrate that by having a sip of coffee. Okay, well, maybe I better worry, or we all should worry about this I naught here for just a minute. And uh, so I naught here goes as um, so we just go up here and square this and solve for I naught. So it's going to be um, e sub i, um, u sub i squared. So e sub i, the irradiance of the illuminating beam times pi r squared, area of the aperture, divided by lambda squared, divided by pi r squared, z squared. So it goes as the irradiance of the aperture times the area of the aperture. But um, maybe we need to also point out we also have the area here. So it actually, I naught goes as the area of the aperture squared. 
And that's the same result that we had when we looked at the rectangular aperture diffraction, uh, Fraunhofer diffraction for a rectangular aperture. So maybe I'll just I'll just rewrite that as e sub i pi r squared squared lambda squared z squared. And so that's power per unit area, just like we had for the rectangular aperture. And also, just like we had for the rectangular aperture, we can write in units of power per unit solid angle. And um, in that case, uh, I naught prime, we'll call it, is just E sub I. The radiance of the incident beam times the area of the aperture squared divided by lambda squared. So we just multiply it through by the z squared. So that would be in units uh, of power per unit solid angle. Okay. Oh, well, thank you. I was checking to see if you were awake and you're awake. It should be lambda squared. So we can't talk about basketball anymore. And uh, how about the, the Diamondbacks? Not that I even like baseball, but the, uh, how, many, how many of you watch the Diamondbacks? I see a lot of interest out here in baseball, yeah. Okay. I'm not nearly as interested in the Diamondbacks as I am in the stadium up there. I have to see that stadium. That looks like uh, something like that. Okay, well, let's go back here. I guess we're not going to talk about baseball. Although the way they're playing, maybe it's not baseball. I'm not sure. Um, so we have this at i is i naught, 2j1, a row over row. And the first zero for row, and I'm sure you have seen this in other courses, the first zero comes when rho is uh, 3.832, uh, which I never remember. But the thing you do remember is that that's 1.22 times pi. And so for the, for the um, angle for the first zero, so I'll just solve it for, for sine theta. So sine theta is 3.832, write it down again, divided by k times r. And so that um, is 1.22 pi. Here we have a 2 pi over lambda. And so that's 1.22 lambda over d. So the sine of the angle for the first zero goes as 1.22 times lambda over d. And for a rectangular aperture, the first zero went as lambda over the size of the aperture. So it's, it's similar, uh, the difference being a 1.22 factor here. And for small angles, you know, we write that as being equal to uh, theta. And maybe I should say here for a rectangular aperture, just we had first zero theta for uh, first zero is uh, lambda over the size of the aperture, b or whatever it is. And so if we were to plot this, Irradiance is a function of angle. Angle or sine of the angle. Um, see. Um, so we would get something that dips down here and then comes back up a little bit, oscillates a little bit. And this here is, uh, well, if the distance of the first zero, 1.22 lambda over d, this is what, 2.44 lambda over d, being the distance between the first zero on each side of the maxima. 
And we often call this thing here, this center portion here, we call that the airy disk. And um, so that's a, a central dark, uh, central bright area. And we would call this an airy disk diameter. Okay. <clears throat> now I think I'll make a little table here comparing the rectangular with the, the circular um, aperture here the, of the relative intensities. So I'll go to a clean sheet of paper here. And so we have a central max and uh, this column I'll say that's this is for rectangular and this is for the circular aperture and we're going to uh, uh, make both of these normalize both of these to one now if we go away from the central max we go to the first maxima so we're going to go to the first maxima here and then the corresponding first maxima in the uh, uh, sink squared function that we get for the rectangular aperture. This will turn out to be 0 0.0496. And if we went through the calculation here, this is 0 0.0174. And I'll write down two more of these, and then I'm going to come back and look at this uh, a little bit physically here, what's happening. Uh, the second max, so what, after the central max, this turns out to be 0 0.0168, and this is 0 0.0042. So I guess one thing we can note is that the central guy is much more intense than any of these other maximas here. So these, uh, probably my drawing is not, um, it's not very good in that these probably don't go up nearly that high. And just for the heck of it, I'll write down the third. 0 0.0083 and 0 0.0016. So there's a little a little difference here in that for the circular, um, these guys are uh, a little bit reduced. Of course, this in the circular case, this is going to be spread around rotationally. And in the rectangular case, we would just have it in the direction perpendicular to the sides. So that explains why these are a little bit lower. Now, what I, I wanted to look at this for a second, look at the rectangular case. It's a nice, nice uh, way of thinking about this here. Uh, if we go to the central max, well, we can break the rectangular aperture up into a bunch of small apertures. And associated with each small region, we can assign a vector. And at the central max, all of these vectors line up, OK? So central max. So we're just associating with uh, each small portion of the aperture a vector, um, which takes into account the amplitude and the phase of that portion of the aperture. Now, as we go away from the, the central maxima, these various vectors are going to be out of phase with respect to one another. And at some point, they're going to be out of phase just enough so that they curl right back on themselves, OK? So we start off here adding up all these vectors. And when we add them all up, they curl back on themselves. And maybe my drawing isn't very good, but the circumference here would be equal to the length of all these vectors, just that they are out of phase, so they curl back on themselves. And that would be the, the first minima. Okay. Now what's going to happen when we get to the first maxima here is that these guys go around once and then half 
again. So maybe I can drawings leave a little to be desired. But they go. Say we start right there, and they go around, and they keep going around until they get to some point over here. Okay. This is going to be the first max, and the length of that first max is this amount right here. And so, um, if the length of this right here is the square root of the maxima, in this case, whatever the radius of this aperture here, we would have 2 pi r times 3 halves is the length of this vector. So going around here one and a half times would give us the length of this vector here. And so uh, 3 pi r is the square root of i naught. And so we would have r here is square root of i naught um, divided by 3 pi. And the diameter of this here, some place I need to write, uh, 2r squared. The diameter of this squared is going to give us the intensity here. And so that would be equal to i naught times uh, 2 over 3 pi squared. Diameter twice of this, so I get 2 over 3 pi squared. And so this number right here should be something pretty close to 2 over 3 pi squared. And I don't have a calculator here, but 3 times pi is slightly less than 10. And so um, 1 over 3 pi squared is uh, slightly less than 1 over well, slightly greater than 1 over 100, and 2 squared is 4. So that's pretty close. 0.0496 is pretty close to that. Mm -hmm. What are the, the, each of those vectors represents? Okay. What's the angle of the Yeah, let me go back. I'll explain here. So I've taken my rectangular aperture, and I've broken it up into a bunch of little regions. And associated with each region, the light, there has a certain amplitude and a certain phase. When I get to the central maxima, all these regions, the phase is the same. And so now the aperture, I'm breaking the aperture up into a bunch of little regions, and each region has a certain amplitude. The light has a certain amplitude. And so I'm representing that amplitude with a vector of some length and some direction. The direction determin is determined by the phase. And so right on axis for the central max, all of these regions are in phase. That's why I have a central maxima. And so all these vectors are in the same direction. And so now, so that would be if I have my aperture. I'm going far away, so I'm seeing Fraunhofer diffraction. And I'm looking at the a radiance right on axis here. So I've broken this into a bunch of little regions. Each region has this vector associated with it, some amplitude and some phase. Now, if I go off axis here, and I still have all these various regions, now the phases between the light coming from the different regions will be different. And so these vectors are no, no longer going to be strictly in phase. And as I go off just a little bit, then these vectors would be just a little bit out of phase here as we add them up. Finally, I'm going to go off here far enough that all these vectors curl right back on themselves. And that's what's happening right here. And the irradiance I get here, or the amplitude, I should say, is a vector from the beginning of the first vector uh, to the end of the last vector. And when these curl back on themselves, then the irradiance is zero. So this would give me a zero. If I keep going off axis, now uh, 
these vectors are going to um, I'm going to have a greater phase difference between vectors. And finally, I'm going to get to a location here where these vectors go around. Say I start here. They go around once and then a half again. And the resulting irradiance is proportional to this distance squared. So that's what I was trying to calculate. I know the circumference as I go around here. Well, if I go over here, the circumference here is equal to this length right here. The circumference here, well, if I go around once and about one and a half, the circumference then for one and one and a half times around will be equal to this. And if the radiance is I naught, then this length here I could represent as square root of I naught. So the circumference plus a half, so whoop, plus a half here. So 2 pi r, r being the radius is, times 1 and a half is equal to square root of I naught. And so then I just solve here for r, square root of I naught over 3 pi. The resulting irradiance is going to be this distance squared or proportional to that. So it's proportional to 2r squared. And so that's I naught times 2 over 3 pi squared. So this number here should be pretty close to 2 over 3 pi squared. Question? Close. Why isn't it exact? Yeah, why, that's a good question. Why is it only pretty close? The, the maxima here will be when this vector right here is a max. And that's going to probably occur slightly before I go around here one and a half times. It's so cool. But think about it, well, it's going to be a maxima. The length here would be a maxima. I go around exactly one and a half times. But it's going to occur slightly before that. And so that's why I say this is approximately true. Okay, why does it occur slightly before that? Because the length, if you just think here for a second, the length is, is going to, I want to make this length as long as possible. And that length, as long as possible, as I keep going around here, that length is going to get a little shorter. And so it's going to be slightly, I don't know just how much, but just slightly before I get exactly to one and a half times around. You're not convinced? No. The longest distance around the circle? Or the well, the longest distance is uh, across the diameter. But the, um, the diameter is uh, getting shorter as I go around here more. Mm -hmm. So it's curling around. It's not. It's uh, curling around, yeah. yeah. So if this occurs at 2 over 3 pi squared, so that's when we went around one and a half times, the next maxima will be when I go around once, I go around twice, and another time. So two and a half times. So this one is probably about equal to 2 divided by 5 pi. And then can you make a wild guess as to what this last one is here? 2 over 7 pi. So you know it's nice being able to go through all the math here, but it's kind of also kind of fun to look at where the um, Think of this in terms of vectors, I, I think. OK. Any questions on that? OK. I'm going to state a couple more things about these um, intensities. We're not going to uh, prove it in this class. Well, I think we actually do prove it in 5.13. And I do have some bad news about 5.13, it turns out that um, due to other classes, I cannot have it at 8 AM. It's turning out. And I feel terrible about that. And I'm sure all of you are very upset, too. But so it's not going to be able. I'm, I'm working on it. I'm trying to still save it for 8 AM. But I think I'm losing. Seven. Oh, that's an idea, seven. I didn't. That was not one of the options that I mentioned. But now that I'll, I'll give them a call right after class, see what I can do. <laughs> OK, so we had these, um, this crazy thing here. And maybe I'll, I will show a couple of uh, 
No, I won't. Not yet. I'll show a couple pictures in a minute. But anyway, we have this airy disk here. And uh, it looks like, you know, a lot of the energy is contained within the central portion. And it turns out that for a circular aperture, about 84% of the energy is contained within the first zero. And we won't uh, show that here, we'll just state it. And then if we go to the second zero, it's about, uh, what do I have? Right, 91%, I guess it is. And the third is 94. Fourth is 95%, and so on. Uh, I don't know that you need to remember these, but it is kind of convenient. The 84 number comes up a lot, but um, certainly it's convenient to remember that a lot is contained within the central, uh, within the first zeros here. And 84% is the number. Okay. Now we have here at this angle goes as 2.44 lambda over d. So let's think about that for a second. So we had the theta for the first zero, um, 2.44 lambda over d. So if we take a lens here, let's say we, we have our aperture, diameter d. And we put in a lens here. And we come into the focal point of this lens. And uh, draw something here. Anyway, if we look at the first, the central core here, so theta is 2.44 lambda over d. What is, if this lens has a focal length of f, what is this physical distance? I should, I should do the whole diameter here. What's the diameter of this airy disk at the focal plane of this lens? If the angle here to here is 2.44 lambda over d, the physical distance is, yeah, f times theta. And so the diameter here I mean, for small angles, this is true. At focal point is 2.44 lambda f over d. Okay. Now, I seem to remember someplace in geometrical optics, this thing f over d, what do we call that? If I had a lens of diameter d and the focal length f, f over d is, call that the f number, okay? That's 2.44 lambda times the f number. So, limiting the aperture here to, to d. And um, let's say the wavelength uh, be by half a micron, visible light, something like that. And I don't have my calculator here, but 2.44 times 0.5 is um, about 1, OK? And so this diameter of the airy disk, uh, airy disk diameter, is about equal to the f number in microns. So I'll just write that. The thing that we call the airy disk diameter. approximately equal to the f number in microns. So if I have an f10 lens, airy disk diameter is about, for visible light, something like 10 microns. f3, about 3 microns. So that's almost something that you can, can remember, I guess. It turns out to be pretty handy. Well, we're saying, first we're saying theta is a small angle. 
And so if I just go up here and angle theta, this distance is going to be pretty close to f times whatever angle I go up. Well, theta, okay. Theta here is a distance from here to here. It's a distance, 2.44 lambda over d is the distance between the two first zeros. Okay. And so the radius here is 1.22 lambda over d. So the airy disk diameter, maybe my drawing is pretty lousy here, but the airy disk diameter f times theta here. I gave you some handouts here. As you know, I'm having a lot of fun playing with Mathematica. And I'm trying to justify it by generating you some handouts here. So anyway, let's just look at a couple of these. They're kind of interesting, actually. Um, so here, um, this is circular aperture. And actually, when I wrote this 2J1 of rho over rho, I wrote it, I put in a 1.22 pi here. And the reason I did that then is that the airy disk, the first zero then will come when rho is equal to one. And so that turns out to be a, a pretty convenient way of writing the um, irradiance for a circular aperture, putting in the 1.22 pi in here. And so now if I plot this irradiance as a function of rho, my first zero here comes out to be when rho is equal to one. And this is the next maxima. And you notice, you know, I said when I drew that on paper that I really made it look much larger than what it is. That maximum is pretty small. And I mean, it goes back to these numbers here. If that's, if the center guy is normalized to one, this is only about 0.017. And so this maxima doesn't come up there very much. And so if I were to plot the, you know, a little 3D plot of the irradiance, you can see a little bit, eh, if you stare long enough, maybe you can see a little peak here, but it's not very large. If we want to plot the amplitude, of course, now we're taking the square root of that, and we actually can get somewhat prettier pictures, because now we can actually see the, uh, the maxima here. What you like, color, of course. So if we make a plot here of the intensity, I mean, if you look at this with your eye and look at the intensity, you really do see this. You see all these rings. You see them pretty nicely. And uh, you can go out several rings, and you'll still be able to see the, see the intensity OK. So again, this diameter here, physical diameter in the focal plane of lens would be 2.44 lambda f over d, uh, 2.44 lambda times the f number. Any questions on uh, diffraction for circular aperture? Okay. All experts on that. OK, well, let's go on here. And um, we're going to go on and talk about more than one aperture now. And that will lead us to uh, talking about uh, diffraction gratings eventually. But the next thing we want to do is talk about a double slit. So this um, is what, 14.4. And this is, of course, still front off of the diffraction. Now, before we begin doing the algebra on this, I like to kind of think about it for a minute. And if we're doing Fraunhofer diffraction in, in the lab, we, we often would just take a lens here. And um, say I want to do Fraunhofer diffraction of, this, of a single aperture, first off. And I'll take a lens here. And we go to the focal point of the lens. And when we look in the focal plane of this lens, we're going to get a, what, a sink squared function for the Fraunhofer diffraction pattern of a rectangular aperture. Now, the, the question, what I want you to think about here, so we get some pattern here that looks like so. 
If I take this slit now and I move this slit sideways, and maybe I'll go to red slits. So taking this slit away, and I'm going to move a slit sideways here. And I'll have it up there. Same width it's supposed to be. How does this pattern here change as I move this slit around? Give me a chance to drink some more coffee. moves to the side, maybe we should vote on this. So one one thing is it moves to the side, another is a little phase thing. I don't know what to yeah. yeah. right. Well let's just think here for a second. What I have is I have this lens and um, you know, if I were to illuminate this with a big beam of light, the light would come to focus here. And so now I'm going to just limit the size of this beam. So as I move this aperture around, the light is still going to come to focus here. Okay, so it doesn't move sideways. I mean, the first guess would be that as I move this sideways, this here is going to move too. But I just think, you just move this slit along here, the lights, you know, if I had the whole aperture open, the light comes to focus there. So if I restrict it a little bit and move that aperture around, the light is always coming to focus here. So as I move this slit around up here, this sync function, at least as far as the intensity goes, is the same. Okay? But, as the smart man in the front row here pointed out, the light will travel a different distance when we get here. And so as I move this around, you know, when this is right on axis, the light's coming like through here. When this is up here, the light's coming at an angle, and down here it's coming at an angle. So probably as I move this around, I get a little tilt term that comes into play. So a phase tilt term. But the intensity will remain the same. And now if we can think back in Gaskell's course, and forget about the jokes, think about he had something probably called the shift theorem or something like that. And what did the shift theorem, theorem say? It said if you move something sideways and you're doing a Fourier transform, uh, you get a linear phase shift, right? Well, the phase shift depends upon the spatial frequency and depends upon how far you shift. So that's all we're doing here. So we move this sideways. The intensity remains the same, but we're going to get a linear phase shift, which in optics terms, I think it was just a tilt in the phase but the intensity will remain the same. Everyone buy that? Okay, so now what we're going to talk about here is a double slit. So let's do a double slit. So we we'll put in a big lens. Focal plane here. And if I put a little slit up here, first I'm going to block the rest of the aperture. Put a little slit up there, I'm going to get sync squared pattern here. And if I put the same slit down here, I would get the same pattern. So if I cover up this one, I get this pattern. If I cover up this one, now the light goes through here, I get the same pattern, okay? When they're both open, they're both producing the same pattern, but the light is coming in at angles. I get this linear phase shift. And so what am I going to get here? I'm going to get my sink squared function. And then these two beams are going to interfere. I'm going to get interference fringes. So some way I'm going to have a sink squared function. And inside of that, I'm going to have interference fringes. So we buy, we kind of, does that sort of make sense? And then we'll go through the algebra to see if it's works out. Okay, any questions? What we expect anyway? Okay, well then let's see if we can calculate this and see if we get anything like we predicted. So double slit here.
problem for diffraction. And I use a separation between the centers of the slits of H. And I use a width of each slit of B. And so the equation we get u as a function of theta, well, I'm only going to do it in one dimension here, is some um, uh, c out in front, which I'm not going to worry about, uh, front off for diffraction, e to the i, k, y, sine theta, dy. And um, doing this over whatever aperture I have here. So that's my basic equation. And so for the case of a double slit, u of theta will be equal to well, e to the i k y sine theta dy. I have two slits, so I'm going to have two integrals here. e to the i k y sine theta dy. And on one of these integrals, the limits will go from minus h over 2 that takes us to the center of this slit, minus b over 2. And upstairs here would be minus h over 2, plus b over 2. So that will be the integral over the lower slit. And for this guy, um, well, it's going to be plus h over 2, minus b over 2, plus h over 2, plus b over 2. Okay. So those are the two integrals I have to solve. Okay. And I think I'm actually going to go through the algebra here. I, again, I know from Fourier optics you can almost, I mean, you can write down the answers here, but I want to, I'm going to work a little bit here on this. So when I do these integrals, Um, and I guess I, I left out my C here, a little, some factor out in front, which I'm not going to worry about. But. And I do the integrals, I'm going to get a C over the I, K, sine theta. And my first integral, then, is going to become E to the I, K, sine theta. Uh, minus h over 2 minus b over 2 uh, minus e the plus i k sine theta uh, minus h over 2 minus b over 2 um, plus h over 2 get this right here Well, I messed up here. Plus b over 2 here. And this one is, what, minus here. Does that look right? No. Okay. And so that's one, one integral. And then we'll write down the other one here, too. So e to the i k sine theta. Now we have, what, h over 2 plus b over 2, and then minus e to the i k sine theta, um, h over 2 minus b over 2. Okay. And, um, yeah, I'll grind through here. At least once we should do this, I guess. So we get C over IK sine theta. And I guess what we can do from this first integral is that we could factor out an E to the IK sine theta minus H over 2. And we're left with an E to the I k sine theta b over 2. 
and a minus e to the minus i k sine theta e over 2. And then for the other guy, we're going to get a plus e to the i k sine theta h over 2. And then we're going to get an e to the i k sine theta uh, v over 2. And we're going to get a minus e to minus i k sine theta v over 2. And so we could rewrite that as C over IK sine theta. And um, I'll write that as E to the IK sine theta um, B over 2 minus E to minus IK sine theta B over 2. So these two are the same. And then that's going to be multiplied times e to the i k sine theta h over 2 um, plus e to the I minus i k sine theta h over 2. And so what we're getting here, we're getting a sine and we're getting a cosine. And so what we could have here, we could have a C, and I'll say a 2i times the sine of k b over 2 sine theta. And down here, we would have an i k sine theta and then we're getting a 2 cosine here cosine uh, k h equal to sine theta I that, uh, I that works out okay and so what we're ending up with then is Two. I'll put a b in here times a c factor times the sine of beta over beta cosine of gamma, where beta is one half k b sine theta and gamma is one half k h sine theta. back to the original drawing, if I can find it. Maybe I can't find it here. There it is. So remember, the, the spacing between the slits were h, and the width of the slit was b. And so what we're getting here is something that goes as the sink depends upon the width of the slit, cosine of something that depends on the spacing of the slits. So this is first guy is just the diffraction pattern due to the width of each slit, and then this will be an interference between the two slits. And we could write here then a irradiance is I naught sine beta over beta squared cosine squared again. So we got the result that we said we would get. We said we would get the diffraction pattern due to each slit. And then here we have the interference between 
the light coming from two slits. Okay. And if I go to, um, I'm still trying to sketch this, so go to one of my drawings from Mathematica here. So what I've plotted here is the green is the envelope function. Just that's due to the single slit diffraction. So that's our sink squared function. Um, and the other term in here is the interference. And so these are just the interference fringes here. So we got exactly what uh, what we kind of predicted by thinking about it. Uh, uh, physically here. Any questions on that? And so if we were to make each slit smaller, the width of each slit smaller, then this green thing would spread out and um, the, uh, these other secondary maximums here would come up higher. If we made the slits further and further apart, the interference fringes would get closer together, and we would get more more fringes here under the sink squared function. Okay. Any questions on that? Well, let's look at this equation a little bit more and look at just where we get bright fringes and. And we're going to find there's something called missing orders that may come into play. And let's see what we have here. So this is our basic equation. And we're going to get bright fringes. For gamma here equal, well, we want the cosine squared to be 1. So gamma is equal to 0 plus or minus pi plus or minus 2 pi, and so on. Okay. And the angular separation between bright fringes well, uh, gamma is going to change by pi in between fringes. So, um, if we go out the distance from the central max, a central bright fringe, the next bright fringe would be pi. Up here, pi is equal to um, uh, one half k, so that's uh, two pi over lambda times one half, so it's pi over lambda h sine theta. And so sine theta here oops, is. Um, uh, lambda over h, and that's uh, approximately equal to theta. And so the separation between bright fringes uh, and angle, angular space is lambda over h. Now, if we went back at the beginning of the semester, we talked about the Young's double slit, and that's the same result we got for the Young's double slit. In fact, these are the same they're really the same fringes as we got for the Young's double slit. The only difference was back then, we were assuming that each slit was very, very small. And so this envelope function here was going to be essentially constant over a large region here. And the only difference we're doing now is we're saying we're opening up the slits, and so we get um, the sink squared function from uh, the width of each slit. Okay, so this is the same, um, same as for Young's double slit. Same thing. Okay, any questions? Well, there's a little thing here um, that we're going to talk about called missing orders. And the thing will happen here is that where these fringes come depends upon the separation of the slits, okay? If the width of the slit is just right, that a zero 
and the sink squared function comes at the location of a fringe, then we're going to be missing that particular fringe. And so we're going to have missing orders. So let's look at that. So it's going to be where we're going to have bright fringes fall at the location of a zero of the sink squared function, and so that fringe will not be present. So we can calculate when this occurs by writing the maximum, do the interference between the two slits, Uh, well, we already said gamma is uh, pi over lambda h sine theta, and that's equal to m times pi for a maxima. M can be m is just an integer, and it can be positive or it can be negative. So this is when we're going to get a maxima. And so we said, well, sine theta then is m lambda over h. It falls from there. Now, I'm, what we're worried about is when we get one of these maximas at the zero of the sink squared function, zero of the uh, single slit diffraction pattern. So let's, uh, let's look at this. Minima uh, due to single slit diffraction. So beta. So we want to see when the sink squared goes to zero. Beta is one half KB sine theta. So beta is uh, pi over lambda B sine theta. And to get a zero in that, um, beta here uh, must be equal to some integer number of pi's. P. And so sine theta for a zero will be P lambda over B. Now, what we're concerned about is that we get a maxima due to the interference at the same location as a minima due to the single slit diffraction. So writing that down. So if maximum of the interference fringe fringes falls at zero of single slit um, diffraction pattern, we will have a missing order. And so for this condition, to have a missing order, we're saying at this angle here, the minima due to the single slit diffraction is equal to this angle here, where we have a maxima due to the interference ranges. So for a missing order, you would have that m lambda over h is p lambda over b. So that says that m over p is h over b. Now m and p are both integers. Therefore, uh, h over b must be a ratio of two integers uh, to have a missing order. So if the, the spacing of the slits to the width of the slits is a ratio of two integers, then we can have this condition that the maxima 
uh, due to the interference is at the same location as the minima due to the single slit diffraction and that particular order will be missing. Otherwise, if, we, if this condition is not satisfied, then we don't have to worry about missing orders. They may be very low in intensity because they're very close to a minima, but they're not entirely missing. Okay, any questions? So we got this nice little pattern here uh, due to the interference of, um, of uh, well, the envelope is due to the diffraction of the width, a diffraction of a slit, which uh, size is determined by the width of the slit, and then these fringes are due to the interference between the two slits, and the spacing of the fringes depends upon the spacing of the slits. Okay. Well, that was for two slits. Now, the next thing we want to look at is what if we have many slits? And maybe we can almost guess what's going to happen again before we go through any of the algebra. So let's um, first we'll write down the section. Yeah. So this is what section 14.5. And this will be multiple slits. This is really going to lead us to uh, diffraction gratings, first binary diffraction gratings. Okay, so now we're going to looking at the front half of diffraction, and um, we're going to have many slits. Each slit will have the same width, uh, but be a lot of slits. And so, if we think for a while, what we're going to get, well, we're probably going to get what the same envelope function due to the width of each slit. And we're probably going to get interference fringes due to the various, the light on the various slits interfering. What would you guess be as to how these interference fringes will change? Sounds like maybe they're not going to change. Is that right? So we're interfering a lot of slits now. So anyone want to make a wild guess before I make a wild guess? Mine won't be so wild because I've read here someplace. But if you just think, you're going to have all these beams interfering. So it's like multiple beam interference. And what did we see before when we talked about interference? When we went two beam interference, we had nice sinusoidal interference fringes. And when we go to multiple beam interference, we get fringes that are sharper than sinusoidal. So probably what we're going to get here is we'll still have the same envelope function, but these fringes probably will not be so sinusoidal. They'll probably become sharper and sharper. And as the number, you know, as the number of slits uh, increases, the fringes will get sharper all the time, okay? And maybe we don't know exactly what the equation is, but actually when we get to it, you'll say, oh, I've seen that before. But in any case, as we increase the number of, of slits, these little fringes are probably going to get sharper and sharper. So we have to go through a little algebra to see if we can show that. And we don't have enough time today to do it all, but we'll, we'll get started here anyway. And we have to pick out a coordinate system. And... Um, The effect of the coordinate system really will be a, a phase factor at the end, which will not be of a, much importance here. So let's say we could do something like this. We have a bunch of slits. I don't know how many, n of them. We'll late, later let n become maybe a large number. And I'm going to pick out a coordinate system. So this is y is equal to 0 down here. And um, I'm going to pick such that all these little guys have a width of B. And the center to center spacing here is going to be H. 
And so what we have is this equation here that over whatever aperture we have here, we have to do the integral of e to the i k y sine theta dy. One dimension again, OK? So we just have to do that integral. And the first integral is going to have the limits from 0 to b, the way I've picked the coordinate system here. And the second one will have the limits of um, h to h plus b. Okay. And the third one was 2h, 2h plus b. And finally, for the nth one, it's going to be n minus 1 times h to n minus 1 times h plus b. Okay. So everyone follows what we're doing. We're starting a mess is what we're doing here. Now I think if you were doing, uh, you know, Gaskell's course, Fourier optics, you can almost, again, almost write down the answer. But I don't want to do that. I want to, I'm not going to go through all the gory details here, but we're going to at least outline the gory details. So um, just starting here in the minute or so we have left, when we do this integral, it's going to be just like what we did before with two slits, except we have many of them here. And so we get a 1 over minus i k sine theta. And the first one here will go as e to minus i k b sine theta minus 1, the way I've picked the coordinate system here. And the second guy here will go as e to the minus i k um, b plus h sine theta minus e to the minus i k h sine theta. And um, I don't know, do I need to write down any more of these? I'll write down one more. e to the minus i k b plus 2h sine theta minus e to minus i k 2h sine theta plus more. Okay. And maybe at this point, um, I have a minute and 30 seconds left. Any questions? Not, I think I'm going to quit early because I don't want to go to the next stage here. But what we'll do next class is we'll come back and we'll finish uh, doing this integral here. And we're going to get a result that I think actually you've seen before in some of your homework, kind of interesting result. But it's going to be basically just what we said. We're going to get these, this envelope function due to the width of the slit, and then we're going to get narrow interference fringes. And as the number of slits increases, the width of these interference fringes gets smaller and smaller. And uh, there'll be some pretty interesting results. Then we'll go on and look more at different types of uh, diffraction gratings. So I'll see you bright and early next Tuesday morning.